I'm going to start now by handing over to Christina Campesuri from the RL UK executive team to do a presentation of some work she's been doing about this theme. Thank you, Christina. Yeah, thank you, Katie, and hello, everyone. I hope you can uh, hear me um, well. Um, so my name is Christina campos Fiore, and I'm the Programme Officer at Research Libraries UK. So for those who will find useful a visual description, I have long brown hair and I wear a pink and black shirt today. So today I'm going to talk, to talk through the results of a recent survey that was designed by the RL UK Decolonization Group, and um, that aim to explore the current practices and needs of RL UK libraries when making collections more with a focus on decolonization practices and understanding the training needs and skills requirements that, sta that staffing and member institutions may have. So in this presentation, um, I will begin by giving you some background information with regards to the work of the RL UK Decolonization Group. I will then discuss participation at the survey and provide some information about the participants' profile before then moving to the findings, which will be presented in two parts. So the first will focus on the strategic priorities and approaches around decolonization across RL UK member institutions. And the second will look at the practices of professionals involved in decolonization activities, the challenges they face and the needs they have in terms of training and skills development. So the RL UK Decolonization Group, consisting of members of the RL UK Special Collections and Heritage Network and the Collection Strategy Network, began meeting in January 2022 to discuss issues of common interest around the decolonization of collections in research libraries. The group organized the session of the Discovering Collections Discovering Communities Conference in July 2022 to assess the appetite for a series of events exploring issues related to the decolonization of collections and EDI more generally. So through this session, the group gathered useful data around delegates' interests uh, in decolonization, as well as their thoughts and comments on a number of issues around decolonization and institutional and professional practices. So it is worth noting that capacity and confidence building through training and skills development was identified as a key need related to decolonization practice that collection holding institutions uh, have. So based on the intelligence uh, gathered through this first, first was the RL UK seminar series, Inclusive Collections of Libraries, which aims to foster conversation around decolonization and inclusive practice in collecting, describing, presenting, and engaging with content in research library collections. And you can find more about the series on the RL UK website. And actually, the next event is this coming Monday. So the second piece of work was the survey uh, the findings of which I'm about to present. So, and before we look at the participants' profiles, I should note that the group acknowledges that there is a variety of definition, uh, definitions used by libraries to refer to their work around decolonization and increasing diversity of collections. However, for the purposes of this work, uh, we employ we employ the broad definition of decolonization. So this definition encompasses the work that research libraries are currently doing to diversify and enrich their collections in order to make diverse voices heard and uncover hidden histories. It also relates to the shift in current practice through challenging existing biases in our collections and the way we work. So the survey, which opened in December 2022 and closed at the beginning of February 2023, received received 62 responses from 33 different RL UK institutions. From these, uh, two institutions submitted a joint response, which was counted as separate responses since they included named uh, comments. Five institutions submitted more than two responses each, and um, one had actually submitted nine responses. And 12 research libraries submitted two responses each, and 17 um, libraries submitted one response each. So also, as you can see from this slide, participants whose role included decolonization responsibilities came from across the different areas of the library. For example, some had collections as their primary area of responsibility, while others were, were working closely with academics and students. We also had some responses from the leadership teams of some libraries, and generally, uh, most of the participants held medium to high seniority roles. So moving now to the findings of the survey. So when asked about whether their library is currently involved in decolonization activities, um, the majority said uh, that it does. Through providing further qualitative comments, participants reported a variety of activities. Uh, some of them referred to current efforts to embed decolonization and other EDI activity, such as diversifying the workforce and institutional strategy, as well as to allocate or secure funding for related activities. 
The majority of institutions mention collection-related projects and initiatives from reviewing collection policies and language in metadata and developing library guides to organizing exhibitions and tours, while many also were actively engaged in decolonizing reading lists and the curriculum in their home institution. So some recent libraries were also setting up studentships and internships to engage students uh, in decolonization activity. And several institutions had established or were participating in EDI, decolonization and other relevant groups that helped shape activity in the area. And many were also delivering events and seminars as part of engaging students and their local communities, as well as communicating about the library's work through blog posts and other channels. Some also provided exa examples of training delivered for staff and academics. So this uh, chart here shows the extent to which participating libraries play a key role in decolonizing the curriculum in their home institution. Um, so as you can see, the majority said that their library does play a leading role or will play a leading role in the immediate future. So regarding the reasons for decolonizing collections and practices, uh, the three most uh, common were to support underrepresented communities and voices, to support teaching and the curriculum, and to engage with the student community. Uh, however, through this uh, graph, you can also uh, see a variety of other reasons uh, for engaging in decolonization activities, such as uh, contributing to the EDI goals of the library. So in, in the next slide, um, so participants were also asked to respond to a question about whether their library or home institution have a working definition strategy or statement around decolonization. So the answers uh, were divided here. Uh, just above one third of institutions said that they don't have a working definition, a strategy or statement around decolonization. Another uh, one third said that they, they too have and uh, a remaining, and the remaining approximately one third said that they were not sure they didn't know or chose other. So from those choosing other, some said that they have provided or are planning to provide some context around the colonization in existing strategies around collections. So uh, this slide here shows who is leading the colonization activities within research libraries or their home institutions. Uh, in just above half of the libraries participating, uh, the decolonization EDI groups in the libraries are the ones driving change in, uh, in collections and practices. However, it was interesting to read in the findings that in several institutions, decolonization efforts are driven by certain individuals in the library or academic departments. Uh, it is worth highlighting here that based on what we found out through a recent RLUK report on equality, diversity and inclusion in the research library, which you can find on the RLUK website, there is often a higher emotional toll involved and it is harder to achieve change when there are only certain individuals responsible for EDI and related activities compared to when a larger group or everyone in the library is involved. So this is something that uh, should be uh, taken into account when prioritizing uh, decolonization in an institution, as it can have an impact on the professional's work as well as their confidence. So uh, next, uh, we, we are looking at how decolonization activities are funded in our UK members, and these were found to be overwhelmingly funded from within research libraries and their home institutions. And there were several participants who said that they were not sure or they didn't know how these activities uh, were funded uh, when asked in this, in this question. So the next slide, so thinking about the types of collections that are undergoing or will undergo decolonization, uh, the majority said that teaching collections and reading lists were the main candidates for decolonization followed by special collections and archives and modern collections. And in the next one, um, you can find more information about how research libraries are currently decolonizing institutional collections or, or how they are planning to do this. So regarding the top five uh, choices in this question, so most are currently diversifying or will diversify their collections. A large number will achieve this by reviewing collection development policies and engaging with the student community, uh, by enriching metadata and reviewing the language that is currently used, and by collaborating with academics, uh, academics and, research, and researchers. But you can also um, find more about uh, the different approaches uh, they are using in that slide. Um, so, and before we move to the second part of the presentation, here's a list with the key benefits and challenges of decolonization as extracted through the qualitative comments that participants submitted. 
So very briefly, the main benefits related to the opportunities of making collections more diverse and inclusive, as well as developing our knowledge about institutional holdings, but also related to the opportunities for collaborative work with library communities. Concerning the challenges, participants mentioned uh, the following, lack of time and resource, sensitivities around language and, and our understanding of the best language to use, difficulties related uh, to engaging ethnic and minority, uh, minority communities in the process, the lack of common understanding around decolonization, including the complexities and sensitivities related to the topic, uh, lack of training at, and not knowing where to start, and sometimes the management acceptance of the importance of this work. So the second part of the presentation will highlight the practices of professionals involved in decolonization activities and the challenges they face, as well as the needs they have in terms of training and skills development. Um, so we asked our participants to let us know if decolonization is part of their role or their objectives. And while approximately the two thirds said that they do have decolonization responsibilities, a large percentage said that they are not for, these are not formally part of their role, which can present a number of challenges, such as just justifying the time and resource allocated to develop their knowledge and skills in this area, which can in turn affect their confidence levels. Just thinking about the levels of confidence of participants in this area, and, and as you can see from this chart, the majority said that they have moderate confidence. So when asked about whether the institution has provided training for them and other staff, only a small percentage said yes for all staff. 30% of participants said that their institutions had provided training only for some staff members, while approximately another 30% said that their institutions haven't provided any training, with some saying that their institutions plan to do so in the immediate future. So participants also listed the types of trainings they have access to and provided many examples of resources that they use to develop their knowledge and skills in this area. So I'm not going to go through everything here in detail, but as you can see from the list here, participants in the survey relied on institutional, but also external, external resources on events and seminars and engaged with different groups in order to develop their knowledge and confidence in the topic. So I'm also pleased to let you know that we, ha uh, that we have extracted these resources from the participants' answers and we can share those that are openly available online today in the Google document and the link will be shared through the chat um, uh, just about and now. So we plan to include these resources as part of the report we're preparing, but we thought that they may be helpful too um, for anyone wanting to learn more about decolonization. So it would be a great opportunity to share this today. So um, now we'll look at uh, three uh, three graphs uh, that actually show that many professionals rely on external resources, events and seminars, as well as their participation in different groups to develop their knowledge and skills. Um, so this first one confirms that the, that the majority does use or will use external um, and community built resources as part of their knowledge and skills uh, development in the area. Uh, the next graph uh, shows that again, most professionals participate or will participate in relevant uh, discussion groups. And this, uh, the last one, um, as you can see, um, there are almost 90% of the participants um, attend or aim to attend relevant, uh, relevant events and seminars as part of their professional development in the colonization of collections and practices. So regarding the challenges around decolonization training in participating institutions, survey respondents said that the two main challenges were limited capacity to undertake, uh, undertake training and limited training opportunities. However, a substantial percentage chose other as an opportunity to reflect on their institutional circumstances. Uh, some comments refer to the difficulty of keeping track of the developments in this area and the fact that it may be hard to move things forward. Uh, others uh, mentioned that the willingness and enthusiasm to develop and support decolonization activities is often there, but there may be insuff insufficient time among the people who make the budget decisions in practice, as well as on the professional's part to dedicate time to keep pushing things forward. And um, some also highlighted the limited capacity to, be, to build long-term links with student communities and the fact that related activity may be seen as being political and thus uh, risky in terms of potentially causing reputation damage. 
So finally, participants had the opportunity to add their comments with regards to the type of support and training needed to help the to help them in their roles and help them build capacity and confidence around decolonization. So again, I'm not going to go through everything here in detail, but I would be happy to share the presentation with anyone interested in looking at this in more detail. Um, I wanted to just to highlight that some of this support may be better provided by individual institutions, for example, uh, making decolonization a strategic priority and setting up internal groups and providing training for staff, while uh, it is more likely for other initiatives such as developing and sharing glossaries or cases of best practice uh, to come uh, from the community. So we're we'll really, uh, really looking forward to hearing your views on this and discussing this issues in more detail um, at the Q&A and the breakout rooms. And just in this slide, you can find my contact details in case you would like more information about the survey or the work of the RLUK decolonization group. And thank you very much for listening, and I look forward to your questions later. Thank you, Christina. That was really, really interesting overview of the responses to the survey and really interesting to see what people are saying about skills and training and confidence, which are some themes we're going to come back to, I'm sure, later. What we're um, going to do is have a couple of quick questions after each presentation, but just keep it very quick and then move to a broader Q&A later because we might see themes across them. Um, so is there anybody who's got any immediate queries just on this presentation before we move along or before I abuse my position as chair to ask something? I'll perhaps start us off. Christina, it's always fascinating to me when you do a survey that you sometimes find things out that were quite surprising. So is there something that stuck out to you as, as surprising in these findings that we might want to think about that wasn't what you expected when you put it together? Well, actually, uh, a couple of things uh, came up that I would uh, like to mention. So one, uh, just very quickly, one was the role of the student activism in driving decolonization. And actually, through the examples uh, provided by some of the participants, so it became evident that uh, in some institutions, student unions and other student groups were driving change in this area even more than academics. So that was quite interesting. And um, the other was the limited mention of external funders and their role in supporting the colonization activities. And given the fact that um, just uh, making collections more inclusive and opening them up will have a broader impact uh, to society, it, would be interest it, it was interesting to see that um, the, the involvement of external funders was limited. Mm. Absolutely. I thought that was interesting. But I suppose I thought it, it in some ways heartening that institutions are funding this themselves because they're their commitment is high enough to make it yeah. a core activity. So it was surprising, but also heartening in some ways. Yeah, it was seen decolonization as mainly an institutional responsibility. So that was um, uh, very good to see. Yeah. Any other questions specifically for Christina before we go to the case studies? Because I'm sure then more thoughts will come through as we get through the session. But we're going to have two short case studies now before opening out into a question and answer. And then we'll have some breakout rooms in the later part of the session. So we're recording this first part. And then we'll stop the recording for the breakout rooms because we want to really think together about actions we can take. Just, oh, quickly, Siobhan's put a, a question in the chat, which I can maybe just bring to Christina. Sorry to back jump a bit, but um, she wants to know if there's any comment on how we can reliably train on decolonization when our staff body is not itself diverse. And how does that not put disproportionate burden on colleagues from the Global South or who come from? more diverse backgrounds. Did that come up in the survey responses? Um, not um, not directly. So we didn't get a comment directly referring to this, but um, it was mentioned as a challenge that if you're not having a diverse workforce, then uh, the, the all the effort and all the responsibilities put to certain individuals and that can, can, can be very difficult for them, have an emotional toll and be, and be uh, challenging. Um, but also what we've seen from um, another report that we uh, published recently around EDI in uh, um, in in libraries. So this is um, an issue that is uh, that is greatly linked to the uh, efforts about diversifying the workshop and making sure the workforce and making sure that uh, um, people from different backgrounds um, work in the library and everyone uh, really has a responsibility around EDI and colonization. So the uh, responsibilities are, are split and um, just not only certain individuals uh, drive, drive this forward. Okay, thank you. And um, that I'm sure might be a theme we come back to um, as well. We're going to move now to the case studies that I mentioned. Um, two different ones from two different places. 
to give us some sort of insight into how how this work is when you when you're trying to do it. So first of all, we've got um, Lucy Woolhouse, who's the genetic librarian at the University of Cambridge, and Joe Milton, who's the library manager of the University of Cambridge Medical Library. And they're going to talk to us a bit about some work they've been doing on inclusive collections in STEM libraries in Cambridge. So welcome. Uh, thank you very much, Katie. <laughs> Um, so I'm Lucy and um, uh, the visual description of myself is I'm, I've got brown sort of uh, curly shoulder length hair uh, and glasses and I'm wearing a sort of blue flowery top at the minute. Um, and I'm also joined by my colleague Jo, who is, uh, uh, yeah, if you want to introduce yourself Jo. <laughs> yeah, I'm the library manager and collections manager at the medical library. Uh, visual description, I've got shoulder length, red brown hair, and I'm wearing a, a multicoloured patterned top. Okay, right, we will get started. And um, yeah, I will hand over to Jo to uh, talk about the first slide that we've got, which, yeah. Thank you. So here's a brief look at some of the kind of work that we've been doing across Cambridge to address issues within EDI and decolonisation. As you can see, there's an awful lot that's been going on, though, of course, it doesn't always translate into concrete action. Cambridge is quite unusual. We have many different libraries spread across departments and colleges, so approaches can be different. This is why we're going to briefly tell you about what's going on in two of our libraries today across STEM. I'm going to hand over to Lucy now. Yep, so first I'm going to give you a, a very brief in, insight into how to I tried to create inclusive collections in my library, which is at the Department of Genetics. So um, this picture does illustrate pretty much my whole library. <laughs> so as you can see, um, it's pretty small. And so space is a limiting factor in what I can do. Um, so one of the easiest ways that I've found um, to try and increase the inclusivity of my collection is to make sure that it is kept up to date. So um, many newer books that are being released are being written by more diverse scientists and therefore keeping an eye on what's coming out is a great way of making your collection more inclusive with less effort. Um, however, science books specifically about protected characteristics can be quite hard to find. So you do have to think outside of the box when it comes to collection development and do a bit of research into authors. So um, one of the main ways that we grapple with inclusive collections within genetics is through contextualizing our historical collections. So the history of genetics is linked with several unpleasant topics, <laughs> including that of eugenics. So one of the main founders of the department, Ronald Fisher, was active in the eugenics field. And while we have and we have many books, both of his and relating to that subject. While it's very tempting to lock these materials away and pretend they never existed, uh, at Genetics, I've taken the opportunity to actually expand our collections in this area to include newer research that places the older materials in their historical context and which grapple with the inherent biases in play at the time. And you can see some of the things that I've recently added to our collections on this slide. Of course, if you're struggling to find diverse books for your particular subject, which can be an issue in STEM, and we'll touch on that a little bit later, um, adding a more general EDI collection can, of course, give you more freedom and flexibility to address more topics. Um, so I managed to get this uh, sort of instigated within my library fairly recently. And um, when I'm uh, doing new acquisitions into it, I always include these new additions uh, on my new book stand and along, alongside the more sciencey acquisitions uh, to make sure that they're visible and include at least one a month in my department newsletter. Um, plus putting this collection together was a great opportunity to liaise with the department to ask what they wanted to see on the shelves. And I'll now hand over, over to my colleague Jo, who can give you a taster of what they've been doing in the medical library with a much bigger collection. Thank you, Lucy. So just to give you a little bit of context, not only does the medical library serve the population of the University of Cambridge, we also support uh, colleagues working in the NHS at Addenbrooke's Hospital and across the east of England. So the next slide, please, Lucy. So we've always supported national campaigns 
such as uh, Black History Month, LGBTQ Month. So therefore, it's quite an easy transition to move uh, across and expand our collections from for medical uh, subjects to the more non-clinical side of things. We've created a dedicated space and you can see some photos um, on the slide that showcase uh, the space. It's called More Than Medicine. And some of the topics include um, health inequality, LGBTQ, well-being topics such as healthy eating, sleeping well, mental health, neurodiversity and women's health. We've also created some reading lists in Leganto to showcase both the titles, but also to include non-print uh, material such as websites and podcasts, and they're all very easily available. The reading lists for the clinical students are also in Leganto, so both reading lists complement one another well. They sit alongside one another and they're easily discoverable, which was very important to us. In terms of the clinical reading lists, I've been encouraging teaching leads to consider a greater diversity of titles. I've got the support from the clinical dean in doing so. In terms of communication, there's a message that goes out to encourage each teaching lead to participate a, um, in responding to reading lists, but also to think about the resources that they're providing. Next slide, please, Lucy. So we've made reasonable progress so far. Dermatology is a good example of that with two um, items there that you can see on the slide, Mind the Gap and Ethnic Dermatology that have been incorporated into our collections. But obviously the work doesn't stop. So next steps are to continue expanding the More Than Medicine collection, think about more topics, continue um, promoting and find uh, other means of promotion keeping up to date with developments and utilizing forums such as um, medical uh, library groups and Twitter, where for example, Mind the Gap really came into prominence. Continuing being a member of some of the decolonization groups within Cambridge, and also conversations with stakeholders, looking at how we can collaborate um, and investigate future opportunities with which to work. So that's the good news. Now let's come on to the challenges. Obviously these challenges are not just related to STEM, but we're looking at it from a STEM perspective. So it can be more difficult to know what to include uh, within um, STEM in terms of decolonization. As librarians, we often have an arts and humanities background. It's hard to keep up to date and identify items that are not necessarily uh, inclusive. Also, many of us come from a white privileged position, which is another potential barrier. The availability of resources is a big problem. STEM seems to have been slower to grasp inclusivity, particularly within teaching materials. It can be hard to find materials and to get hold of them and see how they fit within um, an inclusive perspective. And if they're not used in teaching, if we can't promote them in teaching, then it's harder to justify um, purchase of them. Lucy will take the baton forward. Yeah, so um, as we've uh, maybe obviously made clear through some of the references to digital resources previously, um, STEM research often focuses more on online resources rather than print collections. So we do have to be innovative as STEM librarians to include these digital items within the collections that we're, we're creating. It also means that we are perhaps more reliant on uh, the subject experts within our departments to work with us to identify resources that otherwise we would never come across in our sort of day to day. Um, there is also the potential for resistance from academics, um, not necessarily just in STEM, but obviously, um, you know, there, there is resistance to potentially making these changes to reading lists that have been have been uh, sort of successful in the past. Um, and because of the extra workload that will, might be involved. Um, and also in the Cambridge setup with department libraries, there can be some resistance to diversifying those collections in a more general way. Um, the, the department libraries are often seen as very um, subject specific. And so adding more general collections in can sometimes um, be met with resistance. And then of course, um, <laughs> one argument that's often made about more general kinds of EDI collections is that they can take space away from those core scientific collections. 
And obviously all libraries struggle with space, but we believe it's a worth, worthwhile investment, particularly for STEM libraries. And usually we can talk people around. Um, so we've just got some references on the end of the slides here, but that is it. And thank you very much for listening. Thank you so much. And there was a lot covered in a really short presentation there. So when people have the recordings and, and so on, they'll be able to follow up on those links. Thank you. Um, what I'll do, if this is OK, is move on to the next case study now to give us some time for a bit of discussion after that. So welcome Sarah Whitaker, who's the head of academic services at the University of Leicester Library, who's going to talk to us about a project to develop and implement a reading list toolkit. Um, so I'm going to um, introduce myself, I'll do the visual introduction first. So um, my pronouns are she, her. Um, I'm wearing a black flowery shirt. I have black glasses and grey hair. And so good afternoon and thanks for having me here today. Um, in this case study, I'm going to be reflecting on how work we've been doing to develop and apply our diversifying your reading list toolkit can be considered as a learning and confidence building activity for our staff. Um, so this is very much a piece of work in progress, not a finished project, but I'm hoping that the reflections and observations I make, which are very much my own, either resonate with your own practice and experience or can provide a starting point for further discussions today. So just to begin with some context, um, over the last few years, um, there's been a drive from the centre of the university to diversify the curriculum in response to the race awarding gap. So the library at Leicester formed an inclusive collections group to look at how we could begin to diversify our collections. And one of the areas this of work identified was reading lists. So why reading lists? So um, items on reading lists make up the majority of the resources we require, we acquire and budget we spend in support of teaching. So developing an inclusive reading lists has the potential to make a significant impact on our collections. So our inclusive collections group identified some reading list toolkits that have been produced by other academic libraries in the sector to start to look at how we can make use of them. So at this point, I'd like to pause and say that I was aware that staff confidence was an issue for some staff. Um, so based on things people said to me at the time, two things stood out. One was that we're doing something we're new to and we don't know very much about. We have our kind of familiar tools of the trade, but when we start going beyond this, where do we start? And another concern expressed at that time was that this is an academic matter and we're not the experts. So to me, this seemed to imply we would just kind of reactively wait for order requests to come in and not do much ourselves other than kind of provide a, a service to them. Um, so to me, there's something here we have to unpick about how we view our roles, competences and expertise. So putting these ideas together, the Inclusive Collections Group decided it would create its own toolkit. The idea being this would act as a framework to work to so that we could develop our competence and also change how we think of ourselves, moving more towards a kind of role as a facilitator. So we started out with our library student champion volunteers. They took three toolkits that already existed in the sector and tested them on reading lists from their own programs of study. Um, so the students had some very interesting feedback on their reactions to these toolkits. Um, so they said straight away the existing toolkits focused on author characteristics and they fed back that they felt this could be problematic. Um, they felt it took time for them to find out this information and they questioned whether we can be certain we're making the right assumptions about an author's identity. The students also thought that it's important to consider the contextual issues around the selections of readings and that providing a range of formats is important. So as a result of this, um, co-written by one of the students in um, student library champions and members of the inclusive collections group, we developed our own new toolkit. And this is a series of prompts, it's not a checklist. And they invite the reading list author to think around the subject they're working with, as well as the author's identity. So retain the author's identity, of course, but brought other elements into it. So where we are right now, currently we have a paid student curriculum consultant applying the toolkit to two reading lists in psychology. So um, this is a university, not library, not library initiative. So a student works with an academic supervisor on an aspect of a module to improve its inclusivity. So our curriculum consultant is being supervised by one of our academic librarians, Hina Caravadra. Um, and this work is about to be presented to um, the whole group of academics um, by the student um, at the end of March, so only next week, in fact. So for our next steps, we're going to work with an um, educational develop, 
the developer who's very keen to work with us on this and some academics to apply the toolkit to a small selection of reading lists from contrasting disciplines so that then we've got real and specific exemplars to show to others. So one of my thoughts around staff confidence um, kind of leading on from the last point is related to some of the well-known barriers to partnership working which we often experience in academic libraries. So this is things factors such as academic workload and bandwidth, um, and a culture gap between central services and academics, where central services can be seen as part of the admin burden, which retracts from their work. And I think all of this plays a part in affecting our staff confidence. So in taking a proactive approach to working with our colleagues in this way, I hope we can begin to address this. So just in summary, here are some ideas um, based on reflecting on this project so far about how we can help build our staff confidence. The toolkit we've created gives us a structure to work to, been able to test it with some different audiences so we have a better understanding of its strengths and weaknesses. Some of this is reframing our role, so this is in our own eyes as well as our colleagues in the university. So we're working as partners, not just service providers. Um, and in this way, we're more closely aligned with educational development. Um, building partnerships with a wide range of stakeholders from students to academics and continually testing these ideas helps to give us the experience from which comes the staff confidence. So starting small scale, seeing progress, building on this progress, and then last but not least, supporting each other is how I hope we can build our staff confidence up. So just to do some acknowledgements, um, a lot of this work has been done by the people mentioned on this slide. So especially librarians, um, Hina and Keith, and then the students, Khadija and Megan. Um, so thank you very much for listening. Thank you. And really great to hear some themes across both coming through there, which I'm sure people are picking up already in the chat. What I'll do is, is go through the questions people are putting in the chat. Um, if you have a question, do also put your hand up. I can just about monitor both at the same time on my tiny laptop screen. I'll start though with a question um, from Caroline Gale, which was in response to the Cambridge case study, but I think relates to both in interesting ways. So we might come to both, which is about highlighting online resources. So the, the, as alongside the print resources, how have you been approaching that in Cambridge? And then maybe how has that been part of what you've been thinking at Leicester? So Lucy, Joe, over to you first. Um, in terms of our themed reading lists, it's really just the case of um, keeping your ear to the ground, being aware of what's going on using um, forums such as Twitter, your own networks, um, for example. So um, if we've heard something interesting on the radio, we thought, oh, we can probably get that as a podcast and um, put that in. It's very much driven by library staff. But we have had some um, input from the well-being um, group within the clinical school as well to suggest resources. So those are the things that we've done. Um, Lucy, what about you? Um, so I know that obviously um, lots of libraries are, are sort of now that QR codes are back in fashion <laughs> post pandemic. Um, I, I know that that's being used quite a lot across Cambridge to point people towards the digital resources. Um, uh, yeah, we have got a, a library's accessibility service that's based within the university library and they've got a very good sort of um, uh, well-being reading list that I know a lot of libraries advertise in that way. So, yeah. So, yeah, just, yeah <laughs> from Leicester, um, I suppose we um, we have a kind of digital first policy any, so, anyway, so we haven't really approached this from a um, format perspective. We're just thinking what's the resource and then we get it digitally first if we can, and then print generally. I guess our leisure reading collection might be a bit more flexible in that, but in terms of the work we're talking about here, it's um, um, digital first if it's available. Great, thank you. And there's another question from Heather, which is sort of a little bit related to this, and it might be a little earlier, Lester, I don't know, we'll see, um, about whether you've assessed the circulating or usage stats of the things that have been displayed or highlighted. So have you got any evidence at Cambridge and at Leicester as well of this working yet? I mean, I, I can only talk about genetics. But, uh, I know that the, the books that I talk about in the newsletter particularly do get borrowed. <laughs> um, so, so yeah, that, that, that is a good method for me, but obviously that very much depends on your sort of cohort that you're addressing. We um, have uh, different displays uh, within 
uh, the library space. So quite often if a book's on a display, it will come out uh, more frequently. But what we have found um, particularly around um, women's health um, and uh, our fiction collection as well, which is very broad based, um, and some of our wellbeing collections, uh, now that we've sort of updated the space with some lovely new bookshelves, we've changed the labelling, we've put a different classification scheme in that makes it all um, sort of, it always goes in one place and people know where it is and the staff have been uh, well informed about it all. Uh, the books the, the books that we would really sometimes want to think, oh, that'd be a really good one to tweet about and to use in the display, are not on the shelves because they're out and about which is really, really good news and positive affirmation. I can tell you I've got three of the books on my um, on my account at the moment and the, the um, cookbooks that we've got in terms of managing on a budget, et cetera, they've been doing really well as well. So the books are definitely going out um, and they're being promoted in school newsletters and things like that. And that if people aren't necessarily borrowing them, we've seen them sitting in the bean bags in the collection um, space area with the books, et cetera. So it does seem to be working, thankfully. Yes, yeah, so just to say as, as a separate project, apart, separately to what I was talking about, we do have a leisure reading collection, which has a sort of theme around, um, rep it's called Represent, and it's um, titled by the represented groups, and that certainly had um, good usage. Um, and we do have sort of online reading lists as well that are kind of done by theme that are similarly in line with, you know, Disability Awareness Week and different kind of themes, EDI type themes, and certainly those are well circulated and pushed out on social media. So, and I think as well, we're talking about working with students, um, the students and and SU and seem very keen to engage in this generally. So um, I think there's a lot of potential to work with those groups um, to you know, get more diverse resources in usage. Great, thank you. And Sarah, there's um, Laura in the chat is asking if it'd be possible to share the toolkit because there's, there's I, I think do, that yes. idea of going beyond author characteristics is resonating. So yes, I might. Um, I'm just trying to think the best way because at the moment it's not I can't just plonk a URL in it's internally available so I'm just wondering the best mechanism I'll um do you want to um have a think and let us know yeah. just well, just a lot of interest in the approach yes, so, absolutely, really yes. so I thought what I do just to have another five or ten minutes of this conversation before we move towards breakout groups is take some of the questions in the chat and form sort of thematic things from them rather than going through them one by one. Because there's a really interesting group of questions about academic staff and library staff working collaboratively together. So the motivation for doing this work is often to do with teaching and student experience and, and so on. So could each of our speakers maybe reflect a bit on success stories? How's that worked well? We all hear about the gap, but how have we bridged it? Have we bridged it? Um, what can we do to make this a really positive, collaborative thing? And 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 or is that is that one of the challenges we have to work out how to approach? So in any order you like, just sort of. I can leap in first. <laughs> if you go. Sure. I feel like we're not quite there yet, but we're just identifying people. So I think there are some, um, certainly the university kind of centrally and the kind of PVC for education are very keen on us working with them. Um, we do know individuals who are, we're just about, that's what the next phase of the project. So in terms of actually putting it into practice and making changes to their career, so this is their curriculum reading lists in effect, and that's about to come next. We did take um, our toolkit um, to one of the um, groups of sort of senior teaching academics, and that was really interesting, the response we had some quite sort of interesting, so again, very senior people, very po positive in principle, but I felt a slight kind of, um, not defensiveness in some cases, but I think you've got to be careful that people don't think you're almost telling them how to do their job or, you know, that who are you to tell us what we should do? <laughs> so I think it's the kind of how you frame it and how you go out to people. It's important. Great, thank you. Lucy or Joe, do you want to? I mean, on this next. I mean, I'd agree with a lot of what a lot of what Sarah said. Um, I think uh, I'm I'm doing this on a, a bit of a smaller scale because the there's not as much teaching that goes on in my department um, because it's mostly focused on sort of uh, post grad uh, and research. Um, so yeah, I haven't had too much involvement in attempt it I, I, I've just about got them to put all their reading lists online so <laughs> we're moving in baby steps at the minute 
Um, but yeah, the, the work I did with the more sort of general stuff, um, yeah, there was there was a bit of persuasion that needed to happen and a bit of worry about um, how representative a collection that was so small could be, um, for example. But yeah, obviously that's less less on the academic. And I think Joe will be able to talk a bit more to that in, in her circumstance. Thank you. Uh, so we're very fortunate in that the school is very much behind what we're doing. The clinical dean is very supportive um, of the work that we're doing and encouraging um, responses to uh, reading list questions, for example. We encourage all of the um, teaching leads that we're in contact with for reading lists to um, think about other formats so it's not just print material and to um, think where they can about um, broadening the um, titles that are on a reading list. But clearly, as it's been said in the chat and alluded to in our presentation, part of the problem is actually knowing what's out there. And a lot of stuff isn't out there, it's yet to be written. So perhaps we've got some budding authors in our group today that can um, readdress that. Uh, we also work quite closely with the wellbeing group. So I think a lot of it is really harks back to what Sarah was saying. It's about going out there and talking to people um, and engagement. And if at first you don't succeed, then you keep try, try, try again. And there are small gains. We've all talked about um, gains in our area. So we have got some success stories which we can build on. Um, we're also doing a piece of work at the moment, identifying a couple of subjects and looking at the uh, loans that have gone out over the course of the year, looking at what's available in terms of formats and then contrasting that with what's actually on a reading list. And um, I've got a couple of groups that I'm working with and the conversations will start um, probably after Easter about next steps and maybe that will also result in some changes around reading lists. But I don't say that lightly because I know it's a lot of extra work for academics. And that, that point about extra work for academics comes back to Diane's question about how, how is this recognised and rewarded and celebrated when it's going well? Is, is In any of our institutions, is there any sort of formal or informal recognition of, of this for either library staff or academic staff? I'm not sure that I would really necessarily know of something in terms of the academics other than um, going back to the point that the clinical dean is very supportive. New leads have been set up um, in terms of the curriculum for things like sustainability and ethnicity. So there is definitely a move towards it. But in terms of recognition, I wouldn't be able to comment from the academic point of view. Okay. Jo, Sarah, and then I'll maybe bring Christina in in case she's about to tell us about this from the survey, maybe. Um, so I suppose internally we could, um, there was a sort of conference they did for the first time internally, when I say they, I mean the um, education serve, which is a sort of central services and they invited lots of academics along so you can kind of start talking to the kind of com internal community that I think that's what they're trying to grow of academics that are promoting it and obviously they are key initial partners in this but in terms of so I guess the reward would be being involved with it, <laughs> having a platform. But in terms of um, recognition, I'm not, I'm not aware of that. Okay, thanks. Christina, did you want to come in on this? or? Yes, I just uh, wanted to add a comment uh, about that, that actually from the survey, one of the um, these um, finding models on how you can understand the impacts of the work you are doing in this area and get the recognition. So finding models for that so has been recognized as one of the uh, areas where we need to provide further support. Uh, but I think just related to the building of relationships with academics. So uh, if uh, if colleagues if, uh, manage to, to find champions in their areas, to academic champions, we can uh, support this area. So I think it will be easier to start building, um, getting this uh, this feedback from them and maybe uh, the um, uh, assessing then uh, the assessing the value of the work and the recognition. But yes, this is something that is missing at the moment, as, as colleagues say as well. Yeah, and I think what we've heard really clearly in, in all these different presentations is that this is an institutional responsibility and an institutional set of actions. So working together will will in the end be the best, perhaps only way to really move things in the way we need to and want to. Um, 
in the chat, I just encourage everybody who hasn't had a look to, to have a read of it. There's some really great examples being brought in of particular case studies, work people are doing, really interesting piece in Times Higher by um, one of Caroline Gale's colleagues, example from Leeds, special collections and some working with academics on particularly themed projects and collection areas. Shout out also for Aberdeen and their work. Um, so lots of really, really good practice to share. Um, I'm just scrolling down. Peter's talking about polar libraries and thinking about indigenous communities and decolonizing metadata. Work at Durham on links to slavery and colonialism. So lots of really good stuff.